Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pete Hegseth. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is John Highbush, and I have the great honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. In honor of our men and women in uniform who defend us and protect our freedoms around the world, if you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Before we get started, there are a few people in our audience that I'd like to recognize as special guests. Former incredibly great congressman and his wife, Elton Gallagher and Janice Gallagher. President Ronald Reagan's son, Michael Reagan. All of us know that one of tonight's guests is the co-host of Fox and Friend Weekends. as well as a commentator who appears as a guest on several other Fox News programs. But tonight, you get to watch him in prime time, and better yet, there are no commercial breaks to sell you <laughs> pillows and pain relief and the rest of that. <laughs> we are here to celebrate the launch of Pete Hegseth's book, new book, Battle for the American Mind, Uprooting a Century of Miseducation. Fortunately, Pete's co-author, David Goodwin, is with us tonight as well. Welcome, Pete. <laughs> Welcome, David. Pete and David have been quoted as saying their work is more than a book. It's a field guide for remaking school in the United States. The goal, as they say, is to recover a lost philosophy of education grounded in virtue and excellence that can arm future generations in the fight for freedom. Now, having read their book, I can say without hesitation that thankfully it is just that. The central theme of the book reminded me of a line from then candidate Ronald Reagan's remarks as he accepted the Republican nomination for president some 42 years ago. In fact, the same year that Pete Hegseth was born. <laughs> in that speech to the 1980 convention delegates in Detroit, President Reagan declared, and I quote, let us make a commitment to teach our children the values and the virtues handed down to us by our families, to have the courage to defend those values and the willingness to sacrifice for them. Pete and David are helping their readers and hopefully all of us to answer that call. Earlier in life, Pete answered an even higher calling. He was an infantry captain in the Army National Guard and has served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay. He holds, <laughs> he 
He holds two bronze stars and a combat infantryman badge for his service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when it comes to expertise in education, there's an ample reason to consider David Goodwin an authoritative voice. He was headmaster of the Ambrose School in Boise, Idaho for 13 years. He is the editor of the Classical Difference magazine and president of the Association of Classical Christian Schools. We are honored tonight to have Pete and David with us here at the Reagan Library. All of us have a role to play when it comes to improving education in America today and for future generations. So let us get the conversation started. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please join me in welcoming Pete Hegseth and David Goodwin to the Reagan Library. Welcome both. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Yeah. Appreciate it. Just some quick biographical stuff first, Pete. Pete, you, as I was noting, you were in the armed services, um, heck of a basketball player in high school. Um, I don't think you started off your career as a commentator, as a news guy. How did you and Fox News ever meet? <laughs> Good question. Uh, my first television appearance ever was on MSNBC's Hardball with Chris Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never done TV before in my life, and I had a Marine buddy of mine who'd done TV twice, so he was an expert. <laughs> and he told me, he said, just lean forward. That's his first tip. And it makes you look, you know, better stature, better posture. <laughs> Lean forward and don't let the host cut you off. Mm. 46 times Chris Matthew cut me off. <laughs> so I was a newbie. I, did not, I didn't ever anticipate I'd go into TV. I ran a couple of vets organizations uh, when I came back from Iraq and then Afghanistan, one supporting the warfighter in the battlefield and then another one fighting for reform at the VA, which is still an ongoing issue, obviously. And through that, I ended up doing appearances on TV in different places. And a lot of it ended up being Fox, and a lot of it ended up being Fox and Friends. And then, yeah, I'll never forget, one day they said, have you ever thought about asking questions instead of answering them? I said, I'm happy to try anything one time. Mm -hmm. The worst thing I could do is make a fool of myself. Uh, and it must have gone OK. And that was in 2015, early 2016. And then Tucker Carlson, who was the Fox and Friends weekend host, uh, took the primetime gig, and thank goodness, because uh, he's amazing. And then I, I took Tucker's slot on Fox and Friends Weekend, and that's where I've been ever since. Yeah, yeah. Neat. yeah the, and the rest is history. Uh, David, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it was your pen that wrote these words or Pete's uh, in the book, because it's co author, but in the foreword or right up there in the front, there was. Uh, a note about the fact that when the two of you got together, it felt kind of like Indiana Jones and his father, and one was Sean Connery, <laughs> and uh, one was uh, Harrison Ford. So my first question to you is, well, which one is you? Which of you is Sean Connery, and which of you? We'll leave that to the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm older than Pete, so. How do he even looks like Sean Connery, doesn't he? <laughs> I can't pull off the accent. <laughs> How did the two of you get together for this book? You sure? Yeah. I, I won't monopolize, I, I promise. I was at a Fox and Friends diner in North Carolina, and there was a beautiful young family in the corner uh, who had their two young daughters there in their uniforms. And as I do with every diner, I walked around, was talking to everybody, and I talked to them, and they were talking about this wonderful school, Sand Hills Classical Christian School in, in, in North Carolina that they sent their kids to. And I had known about classical Christian school, but I, my interest had peaked around that point. I want to learn more. The school system is broken. What do we do? And they said, you got to meet this guy, David Goodwin. He runs the Association of Classical Christian Schools. You got to shoot him an email. Uh, and so I did. I shot him an email. I said, I want to learn more. What do you guys do? And he shot me tons of information. Uh, he had already done a lot of writing and research on this topic. And I kept reading it. 
I'm reading it. I'm calling him. I'm calling him too much, I think, like over <laughs> on a regular basis. I'm calling, David, I got a question about this. Can this really be true? Is this true? And, and then at one point, I remember looking at my wife. I'm sitting in my office, and I said, babe, uh, she runs, by the way, a lot of the live stuff on Fox Nation. And, and I said, we got to make a movie out of this. Like, people need to know what is going on, from John Dewey to the original Pledge of Allegiance, which we can get into that, um, to the Bellamy salute, to what the progressives did and how they used prohibition, the whole story. And what David had done and the research he'd done was just, it was a no-brainer. And so we got to work on the film and, and then eventually the book. But none of this happened, none of this happens without David Goodwin and the research and expertise he brings to the topic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Now, I bet that just about everyone in this audience has now uh, some familiarity with this whole critical race theory uh, it being taught in our nation's schools today. But what I found fascinating in this book is right up front, the two of you make the point that <laughs> that's just a very recent tip of the iceberg. This problem is really as much as 100 years old. So one of you, please explain that. Please. Well, it is. Um, what, what's really an amazing part of the story of the development of the book is that we started in March of 2020, which, if you remember, that's before CRT went front and center. It was before the George Floyd riots. It was before even COVID. So the interest early on was Pete and I were thinking this story needs to be told of what was happening in the early part of the 20th century because nobody's told the story. But as we went along, history was unfolding us in front of us, and the schools were deeply involved. And Pete, Pete kept coming back with, hey, what about this? I had this, this person on TV today. They said this. Have you ever looked into this? And so pretty soon, it was a truly collaborative product, project where Pete was writing. He's written most of the parts of the book that deal with the contemporary issues of our day. And you, what we found out is they fit together like you know, hand in glove. I mean. John Dewey no sooner gets through with his work that I researched in Columbia University than the Frankfurt School shows up. And Pete had a lot better grasp on that side of things than I did. So as a whole, I think the work was really providential. It was something that wouldn't have come together had it not been the time and the place and the partnership. Pete? Yeah, I mean, the progressives had the targeting of our youngest minds on their mind from the, be from the very beginning. Right. They, they knew they had to remove the one immovable object inside American civic life and in Western civilization if their schemes were to ever catch on. Uh, and they understood that immovable object was God, was faith, uh, and that it was at the centerpiece of the American classroom since the founding. And they had to replace it, the way we describe it is, to, to keep the Indiana Jones analogy uh, going, it's like when you're trying to grab a, a precious artifact, but it's on a pressure plate. And if you're, if you're gonna, if you take that artifact off the pressure plate, the alarm bells go off. If they had removed God immediately 100 years ago, the parents, the culture, the communities, the churches would have revolted. And so they openly wrote in the New Republic and other publications, and this is the research that David did, they openly discussed how do we remove God from the classrooms? What, that's the immovable object. And they ultimately landed on a forgery, which the culture at the time was willing to accept, uh, which effectively was allegiance to the state. It was the flag. It was a new pledge, a pledge of allegiance written by a socialist that didn't say under God when it was originally written. Uh, I love the flag. I proudly said the pledge, uh, pledge of allegiance today at the beginning. I, I revere it. For them, it was a new idea around which they could get society cohere that was more malleable uh, than nationalism being more malleable than biblical truth. Because when you have biblical truth and objective truth, you, you can't move people off of that. So they, they, what you'll find when you read this story of the, from the characters is almost to a man and to a woman, they are atheists, humanists, socialists, and then eventually Marxists who reject biblical truth, who reject the idea of human nature and our fallen nature, sinful nature. And when, once you can change and reject that, then you create a laboratory for societal change inside classrooms. And one of the other things that David uh, 
discovered through his research and we write about is the early progressives studied one of the first successful social movements, which was prohibition. Uh, a woman named Margaret, uh, what was her name? You, Willard, you, Francis Willard. Francis Willard, because I always get Francis Bellamy and Francis Willard yeah, missed yeah. up. Francis Willard, who's a suffragette, uh, um, uh, a socialist, said if we, can, if we can put it into the curriculum of third graders, maybe we, we start to have a chance. So in the 1870s, third grade curriculum, anti-alcohol was put into classrooms. It was still an ad hoc system. This is before John Dewey. This is Horace Mann. These are loose public school associations. But a third grade curriculum was put in. By 1919, what do you have in America? Prohibition of the sale and consumption of alcohol. And the progressives said, wait, if you can do that with third grade curriculum, what else can you do with third grade curriculum? Uh, and they discovered a word called paideia, or they didn't discover it, they knew it. So did our founders. We, I've learned it from David, and we talk about it in the book, which is how you educate and train up the youngest. And if you can shape the youngest of minds to have a different understanding of the value of a good life, you change the entire way uh, a society and a civilization looks at what they value. Well, so as we said, the pledge, um, one nation under God, indivisible, would you go so far as to say that, well, when socialists and those who created the pledge were after what you've described to them under God, God essentially is the state. It's not a... Uh, yes, and, I mean, yes, originally, but the original pledge written by Francis Bellamy did not include under God. Mm -hmm. uh, under God was added by Eisenhower uh, when we were fighting the godless communists in the 50s. Mm. So the original pledge has no mention of God. Mm. And to oversimplify, basically what the progressives did, they said, uh, and it was always under the guise of vocational training for a new economy, but what they did is they replaced a cross and a Bible in the classroom with a flag and a pledge. Uh, over time, gradually speaking, while saying, okay, we're going to start a different type of school over here where, yeah, God's not allowed inside, but we have a pullout period where you can go uh, to instruction outside of the, of the school, not on school grounds, but we still respect um, that you have faith in God. So it was always incremental. And then when they moved it to New York, they took a different approach. And I, you should explain the idea of the Gary plan, uh, David, because that's one of the things that blew my mind. They started a school in Gary and Indiana that intentionally tried to change the way school worked altogether, K through 12. Right, their intentionality was visible because they created these model schools and actually several places around the country, but Gary became the center point of it. And the thing about Gary was, anybody who knows the town, you may know it from the musical or whatever, but uh, it was formed in about 1905. Uh, so it was a very new city, and they could take the education wherever they wanted to take it. So one of Dewey's disciples uh, was the superintendent of that area, and they built the Gary's plan there in um, Indiana. And its features were things you probably all thought were always in school, like bells that ring at the end of a 55 minute period, uh, the seven period day, the idea of subjects broken up and the social sciences being inserted into it. And Pete talks a lot about the social sciences element, I'll leave that to you later, but um, this was all packaged up and they removed religion, Christianity from the classroom by simply putting it in a pullout period. And where I first encountered this story was when I was reading the back and forth in the editorial pages of the New Republic between 1915 and 1918, where they're arguing about how to get God out of the classroom for good. Because the one side was saying, hey, if we put it in a pullout period, we can eventually just drop it. And the other side was saying, we shouldn't have a pullout period especially when you import it back into New York, which is what happened with the Gary Plan. It was successful, so they imported it back in New York. So the whole modern American experience, especially in high school, was designed in Gary, and it was designed without God. It was the first design in, of that type. In, in the book, you describe at some length um, this whole woke movement, and, you know, part of being woke is, hey, you're invading my space. Hey, those words are harmful, you know, all the rest of that. Uh, I, I, I read this, I just could not believe it when I read it in your book. And that is that the, our United States, the National Archives and Record Administration, the agency that is the nation's attic, it keeps all of our records and takes care of the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. 
Well, when you access the archives website, it suggests up in the top right hand corner, uh, these are, there are harmful warning, there are harmful words in these documents. I, I, how can this possibly be? <laughs> It's true, you go to the website of our National Archive for the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of our United States of America and there is a trigger warning of potential violent content, inappropriate content. Now that's the logical extent of the view of the left. You see, they, they, they want to reject, they have rejected the ideas of our founding and their theories were dedicated to that from the beginning of when they landed on our shores. So David talked about the early progressives, John Dewey and other names you'll be introduced to. Then you have the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School who flee Germany. They're all Marxists. Uh, they flee Hitler, they land in New York, and they are welcomed at Columbia University where John Dewey had been a professor. What is John Dewey at that, what is Columbia at that time and what is Columbia Teachers College still today? the preeminent teacher's college in the United States of America. And the Marxists arrive with a new theory called critical theory. Sound familiar? It's the precursor to critical race theory and critical gender theory. And they begin to, uh, to teach it, and they begin to teach it in the teacher's colleges, which means when those teachers go out and, and become heads of their departments or other places, they're teaching critical theory. And what is critical theory, to your point? Critical theory is a, its premise is to deconstruct effectively Western Christian paideia or Western civilization. It is criticize all things that lead to the white Euro patriarchy uh, capitalist system that must be torn down uh, if we're to advance Marxism. Uh, they thought in an economic sense, but it soon became a cultural sense because they knew the bourgeoisie proletariat class warfare wasn't going to fly in the United States of America. Uh, instead, our, our, our terrible past of racial injustice was more fertile ground. And so the critical theorists eventually landed on critical race theory as the way in which they could indict America from the very beginning. And we call the first chapter of our book the COVID-1619 moment. Mm. Uh, because COVID-19 happens, the Zoom classroom comes into all of our homes, and you open up the laptop, and in American history, they're teaching 1619 is the new founding date. It's because they have rejected 1776 and the principles thereof, and they're indicting America from the very beginning as being a terrible country. So, that type of logic at the academic level, which has now made its way pervasively into the K through 12, of course leads government institutions to say that the Declaration and the Constitution need trigger warnings. Because they were written by slave owners. And therefore they must be canceled. And we need to find a new founding date and all the wisdom that they had, despite their flaws, has to be rejected. See, that was the premise of critical theory from the very beginning. So they, they used to only teach it in higher education. And now all the teachers that have been through the teachers' colleges and handle the accreditation that have gone, that are now in bed with the unions. And by the way, I see Rebecca Friedrichs here, uh, who's a great friend of ours, was in our film, Miseducation of America. She wrote Standing Up to Goliath. She took on the teachers' unions in California for 30 years, was a teacher, just an amazing individual. <laughs> So we've drawn on a lot of wisdom from a lot of people who've been on the front lines of this and frankly we're yelling about it before people were paying attention and now they are paying attention. But those theories are, have, have, been, have been embedded into our institutions and that's how you get to the point where something like that appears on a website. Well explained. This is why you have to read this book. Really well done. Um, let me, I'll pull a quote from your book and I'd like you to explain it for us. The right has long held the right principles, but the left controls the positions. What do you mean by that? You want to? It's a political question. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> what do I mean by that? What I mean is, you know, look at local school boards. Look at, um, you know, union representation. Look at uh, our universities. Look at... We stand on principles that we know are timeless and believe that they should be timeless and that they do stand on their own, whether they're the brilliance of our founding or the wisdom, uh, the biblical wisdom. 
And then the left goes ahead and runs for all the positions, takes over all the institutions, and then pushes out all the stuff we thought was <laughs> timeless and would be there no matter what. If there's one thing you could fault the founders for, it's assuming that this type of education would continue, that it's how kids would be educated at some level with an understanding of Greek and Latin and great books and, and our biblical Western civilization narrative. That, they kind of assumed that would be the waters that we swim in and they, they hadn't anticipated the critical theorists <laughs> and others who came about after that and tried to deconstruct everything that they did. So that's, that's why we're not trying to be pessimistic in this book, but you guys remember you, uh, the stuff we covered on Fox of uh, parents rising up at school boards, right? Loudoun County, Virginia, uh, Glenn Youngkin gets elected. It's all amazing stuff, and it's wonderful to see, and it's heartening, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, but those types of actions in today's government schools, because that's what we should call them, they're government schools, public schools are government schools. Those types of actions, as we say in the book, I feel like it's like charging a fortified machine gun nest with Nerf guns. Mm. We salute your effort, but we're going to bury you all. Because those school boards, what do they do to those parents 95% of the time? You know, good luck. See you later. Next. And what changed? My mom protested at PTA, uh, at PTA meetings in the school board in the 1980s and 90s when I was in elementary and high school. And God bless her. She took me out of those, um, out of those courses, whether it was the new sex ed course or this new quest self-esteem thing that's quite benign by today's standards, but she recognized it for what it is back then. And she protested, and she pulled me out. Well, guess what happened at Forest Lake Elementary School in Central, High, Central Middle School? Nothing. 99% of the other kids at Forest Lake High School still went through that education and still got the Quest program, and now we're on our 95th iteration of that at Forest Lake High School in, in conservative Minnesota. They control the pipeline of every aspect of the educational industrial complex. The unions being their most powerful arm of that, but the teachers' colleges, the textbooks, the curriculums, the certifications, the accreditations, all hard leftists. So we want to disavow people of the idea that you can move to a, a nice zip code uh, or I'm going to move to a conservative community and everything's going to be okay. The problem is, is the pipeline has been federalized and, taken, and they control those positions. And so protesting is good and, and doing something for your kid is good, but we argue it's, it's utterly insufficient at this point. And if I could add just the one thing, the money involved is the icing on the cake. It's the biggest industrial complex, even rivaling the military industrial complex in this country, dollar for dollar. So not only is the infrastructure solidly in the hands of the progressives, but the money is too. Yeah. Pete, you went to uh, what has to be defined as an elite school for university. But in the book, you, um, the both of you note that your quest was to find not an elite education, but rather the best education. What is the difference between <laughs> the elite education and a best education? You're an expert. Well, by today's standards, an elite education would be Princeton, where I went as an undergraduate, or Harvard, where I went as a, uh, for a master's program. But I don't know if you saw on Fox and Friends recently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did bust open my diploma to Harvard and write return to sender and mail it back to him uh, live on TV. Because our most elite institutions are poisoning the minds of our, not just our kids, but our country. And as, if we hold them up as standard bearers of excellence and gatekeepers of credibility, then we just continue the cycle of perpetuation. By the way, it's not just my so-called elite backgrounds. It's probably your alma maters, too. Take your pick. Unless, you're, unless you went to Hillsdale or Liberty or you know, College of the Ozarks. I saw one back there. <laughs> your university is probably dutifully pumping out hard leftists and Marxists at a rapid pace. Read your alumni newsletter. Go back, go back and take some coursework. Just peruse the website. Yet we just, by default, because we like the sports teams or the nostalgia of drinking beer in college, <laughs> we pump checks to these institutions. And we might as well just send it straight to the Democrat Party. 
that, that, and so any part of perpetuating that, I believe is part of perpetuating a cycle that's hurting our country. So when I say the best institutions, I'm t what I'm talking about are David schools. I'm talking about classical Christian schools at the K through 12 level. Because my mentor at Princeton, his name is Robbie George. He's an amazing conservative constitutional professor. By the way, there's a renaissance at Princeton of conservatives. There are now 25 outed conservatives in the faculty at Princeton. <laughs> all, all because of one man who started an institution and, and has built it. It's phenomenal. But he has a quote in our book where he says, it used to be the liberal professors that licked their chops at indoctrinating these naive, you know, Bible-clinging kids that showed up at college. And now it's the exact opposite. It's the liberal, it's the conservative professors, the few among them, who lick their chops at, uh, at undoing the indoctrination of the kids who already show up woke and indoctrinated. See, the problem's not higher education. Higher education's already gone. Hmm. The problem is K through 12. That's the focus of our book. And they're consolidating that on K through 12. And when I talk about a great education, not an elite education, the kids David pumps out are elite. They're elite performers. They're elite students, they're elite critical thinkers, they're elite debaters, they're, they're, they're ready to go into the culture and engage and win. So by that definition of elite, they are elite. If, if, they're, if you mean elite by pay $50,000 so your kid can be woke, they're not elite. Uh, that's what a lot of the elite high schools or middle schools look like that are pipelines to the Ivy League. These are pipelines to wisdom. Timeless wisdom, the type of education that our founders received that gave them the ability to debate what they debated 250 years ago and create this form of government that is a republic if we can keep it. I didn't get that education and I got a standard, you know, every time I'd talk to David, the only thing I would, the first thing I would say to him is, why can't I go back to one of your schools? Because <laughs> I learned almost nothing. No, if I look back at the social studies that I learned, and we all took social studies, I bet you all did, social sciences, social studies, political sciences, guess what? All disciplines made up by Marxists. All of them. It used to be geography and philosophy and theology and civics and, and politics. They deconstructed it to, to dumb it down, to make it all a scientific method that could be explained because there's no more objective truth. We all got a progressive education and we didn't know it. What David's doing is unearthing a, a hidden form of education that the progressives almost completely buried by the 1970s and is now giving a generation of Americans a chance to actually get educated. My seventh grader, who's been in a classical Christian school now for six years, understands ancient Greece and Rome better than I ever will. Which means he's engaging with the big ideas that the founders engaged with as he goes into a culture totally awash and devoid of them. That's what I would call elite. Uh, and, and that's how I would like to try to redefine it. Wow. And following on that, perhaps the two of you launch off from this sentence in your book, which you note is the problem is not what's being taught in our schools, but what's not being taught in our schools. So give some examples of, this cl of a classical Christian education um, that you think will, in fact, develop elite thinkers. And that's you. Well, one of, one, of the, um, one of the things that we have a tendency to do, I think, is take for granted things that um, history gave us so long ago we've forgotten. Um, the uh, seven liberal arts which are the basis of classical Christian education, were they, they date back to the ancient Greeks. And the principle was that if you were going to form some type of republic or democracy, you had to prepare your children to think for themselves. Because if they just listened to whatever doctrine somebody gave them, they would vote for the tyrant. Because that's, that's and you're gonna go back into tyranny. That was the fear of the Greeks. It was the fear of the Romans. And it was the basis of this country when they built the country. That's why we have eagles on our, on our stanchions, right? And many other Roman artifacts, because they were hearkening back to this idea that a republic requires free thinking people. So the seven liberal arts, the first three, uh, which is what I'll talk about briefly here, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, training in how to use language well, training in how to use logic, 
and to think well through the study of both formal and informal logic and the practice. One of the things we do in classical schools is we practice thinking. We don't tell kids what to think. We practice them in the art of good thinking. Very different kind of education. It's not one teacher standing in front of a room of 25 kids and telling them what to think. They're around tables. They're engaging each other. They're trying you know, to learn to argue well. Um, and the third uh, subject in, in, the, in the trivium is rhetoric, which now is a dirty word because politics kind of shuffled it up. But it was originally the art of understanding the comprehensive whole of a topic and being able to communicate that to other people and persuade them to follow you, which of course is the heart of a democracy. It's the heart of a republic, is to have discourse. And what we're seeing right now in our country is discourse is being shut down from every angle because we can't stand to hear things we don't like to hear. Yeah. Um, and the solution is not necessarily, if you're a parent out there and you're trying to figure out, well, where should I send my child to school? The solution, uh, Public schools are the government schools you've talked about, which are the real problem. But the solution is not necessarily, well, I'll spend 50,000 bucks and send my kid to a private or independent prep school, correct? Correct. In fact, uh, I would argue that most of the private schools are even worse uh, and more woke. In fact, a lot of the Christian schools and Catholic schools uh, are maybe not as bad on the surface in every way that you see that, but they're still, they're still built completely on the progressive model of education. That's what I think, that's what shook me so much at the beginning in working with David, is once you start to dig into it and realize, he likens it to a, a, a capsized ship. You know, if you've been living in a capsized ship for 100 years, you feel like the, 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 the wall is the floor, and that's what you've lived in. But then when you tip the capsized ship back up and you realize you've been living sideways for 100 years, everything looks completely different. That's what David's movement has had to do since the 1980s, is revive a lost form of education because it was almost completely gone. There were, I would say, the darkest days of education in this country were the 1970s when there was no such thing as classical Christian, and they almost outlawed homeschooling. They were very close to doing so. They tried to outlaw all a parochial schooling as well in Oregon earlier and before that. They'd still like to if they could. Thank goodness for the Supreme Court and the ruling we got just last week on in Maine, amongst other fabulous rulings. Uh, it's been a it's been a good day for it's been a good week for our founders and their and their <laughs> structure of government. And for so many other uh, leaders in this country, including Ronald Reagan, who have been fighters for life. Uh, for generations, and here we are. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. Uh, I would just say that uh, you have to you have to break down the assumptions that you have about what education means, especially in a Christian context. And that's why um, I think classical Christian is so different. And it, what we've tried to do is break down um, the preconceived notions of classical means outdated dusty, old, kind of like how people have looked at homeschooling. Well, homeschooling means, you know, weird or, or, or not socialized, which is not the case. Uh, and if you look at how it's done today and done so well, uh, it's amazing what they're doing in homeschooling, and including pods and co-ops and online curriculum and classical Christian homeschooling. I mean, there are more options today than there have ever been. Uh, for a great education for your kids and grandkids, which is, I think, one of the good news stories out of this. David has almost 500 brick-and-mortar classical Christian schools across the country in, uh, in 46 states. Uh, there's a bunch here in California. Uh, there, there's a bunch across, across the country. Now, we argue for parents and grandparents taking a radical reorientation of your lives and saying, next to your family uh, and, and next to your faith, the, the next thing, next step you can take is where you educate your kids, where they spend 16,000 hours between the age of kindergarten and 12th grade. 16,000 hours, we, that was the original working title of the book, 16,000 Hour War, uh, because that's what it is. We, do you really want to send your kids to 16,000 hours of Democrat camp? <laughs> <laughs> because that's basically what we're doing right now when we send our kids to 
90% of the K through 12 schools that exist in America today. Um, I would argue you don't want that. And even in, the, in some of the articles that David uncovered, uh, the progressives wrote about that. And in fact, you, you would know the quote better than me. What, uh, what chance does one hour of theistic training on Sunday morning have against 40 hours of secular training during the week? Who, who said that, David? I can't remember. Charles Potter. Charles Potter. They knew from the beginning. And frankly, the Christian church, we did it to ourselves as, as a movement. Uh, when the church abdicated its responsibility on education, and David writes so beautifully about this, there's the social justice arm and then the fundamentalist arm. Ultimately, the, fun, the social justice arm joins with the progressives, and the fundamentalist arm says, well, we're just here to save souls, which is wonderful. Uh, but it basically said, we're not in the school business anymore. What got created at that moment? Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So instead of sending our kids to a school Monday through Friday that has God in it, we take God out of the schools and we send them to school for one hour on Sunday. Uh, and then you see what happens as a result. So I would look very closely at any elite school, any private school, and any Christian school and look at the baseline prerogatives of what they teach and compare it against the liberal arts uh, classical approach that David has. And I think you'll see a stark difference. Don, if I could just draft on that real quick, this real quick. Um, it's exhibit A in what we were talking about with the deep educational state where they control accreditation, teacher certification, teachers colleges, because it doesn't matter if you go to uh, a Christian high school or an independent prep school, they're all trained in that system. So that's the point we were trying to make is that the reason they're woke is because they get the same training as everybody else. The only, the prescription we have in the book is get out and, and go a, a totally different direction. Tactical retreat is what we call it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That sometimes when you're surrounded in this immediate moment, the first movement is retreat. And then we argue in the book for an educational insurgency. The form of warfare of the weak against the strong, the small against the big. Uh, David started that insurgency through his schools. And, you know, we're seeing Arizona just had a universal educational tax credit program. Um, it's a beautiful thing mm. that there, there's some movement there. We're going to turn it to the audience for questions in just a minute, but I want uh, two trigger words, I'll call them, that you, uh, you said, Pete, that remind me of. First is, you know, the Reagan Foundation and Institute were blessed in that uh, we're able to give a million dollars in college scholarships wow. each and every year to often between 10 and 20 uh, students. And what we are finding is that more and more of those that have risen to the top that become finalist competitors are homeschooled. It's really a, been a fascinating thing to watch. Uh, second thing, I, before we go to questions from the audience, I wanted to just read a quote from Michael's father here, President Reagan, in his farewell speech to the nation in January of 1989. The president said, an informed patriotism is what we want. Are we doing a good enough job teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world and what it means to be an American? We've got to teach history based not on what's in fashion, but what's important. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I'm warning of an eradication of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit, Amen. right? Amen. That's it. I... That, was, that was the end. At the beginning of Reagan's term, he commissioned an educational uh, assessment of America. And I can't get this quote right, but it essentially concluded that if a foreign country had done this, we would have called it an act of war. Yeah. Look it up, it's, uh, yeah. it's the report coming out. We'd like to turn to you, the audience, for questions. Um, just a quick primer. Um, if you have a question, of course, raise your hand. But please wait until we get a microphone put in your, in your hand so that we can hear your question. Questions, so we have one right here near the front. Hi, thank you very much. Pete, question for you. Because of your occupation and perhaps the circles you travel in, 
do you encounter um, media from the left and ever have discussions with them on their positions? Do you ever go have a banter with them, go back and forth, or do you pretty much stay to people on the right? How does it work in your profession? Uh, just when I talk to Juan Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would love to. I, I have no, uh, for, first of all, I get a chance to work with some of the best conservatives in the business with Rachel Campos Duffy and Will Kane and the guys, who, I mean, it just, I mean, we're chock full of them at Fox and I'm grateful for that. I will say this, the left-wing media is not the most tolerant bunch in the world these <laughs> days. Um, not only would they not want to have a conversation with me, I, I would count myself as someone who's gone to some pretty left-wing universities and, and, and hung around. I'm, ha I'm happy to have a conversation with you knowing we disagree and, uh, and know that we're probably going to come to a different conclusion at the end of the conversation. The problem is these days you talk to most members of the media on, on the left side of the aisle and the only way that conversation is going to go is they're going to end by saying, you're a racist. <laughs> no, I mean, really, that's what it devolves. It's, it's an absolute mischaracterization, straw man characterization of the opponent as, uh, as less than human. Uh, I, I have the, the private conversations I have with people left of center at Fox are wonderful, wonderful, because they're at a place that actually tolerates. Uh, and uh, one quick anecdote, I have a bunch of friends that have worked at CNN who are conservatives, uh, and every single one of them has gone running for the exits because eventually they're cornered and run out and screamed at and told what horrible human beings are, especially if they supported Trump. I mean, it's you're, find the door, or you're going to sit on the shelf and never be on TV. I've never met a liberal that works at Fox that didn't say, this is the most wonderful place I've ever worked. Because we do tolerate. Yeah, we have discussions on the air, and we have it out. But at the end of the day, I can ask them about their kids and their life, and what do you think about this? And they'll compliment me on the book, and oh, I saw this. So it can exist when you foster an environment that it exists. And that environment, I believe at Fox, is the shared value that America is a good country. And God is worth celebrating. When you can agree, when you can agree on the basics, then you can figure the other stuff out. Well said. Over here. You're gonna hold it. Okay, thank you so much for both of you being here. I'm so excited to read your book. It's a little overwhelming to listen, and I have three millennial kids that haven't had kids yet, but do you have a suggestion as to how we can communicate, besides just giving them the book, or how do we, and also, it's a two-part question, that, because I would like to be able to communicate that to two of the couples, of my kids who are trying to have kids to look at this. But the other side of it is, what can we do in the audience to help this movement? Well, I talked to a gal last week who had the same question. Um, she uh, didn't, um, wasn't sure she was gonna get them to read a book, but they did watch the Miseducation series and it was very influential for millennial kids. They had never heard that before. So I would certainly commend that um, on Fox. Um, I don't know. I agree. Miseducation of America, it's a six-part series now on Fox Nation. We basically tell the abbreviated version of the book in film form, and we work with a great producer, John Case, who put it together and just did a phenomenal job. So if, if they're not going to want to read it, they'll, I think after watching it, they'll probably want to read it even more. Um, and I think... I think ultimately coming at the topic with humility to your kids, which is exactly what I'm going to do to mine someday when they're old enough to understand why we made all the choices that we made, is to be like, I had no idea. I, I, neither did I, I, And so you're going to want the best for your kids. And maybe I didn't know that when I was going through because it, was, it wasn't so laid bare in front of me. But now I know, and you're going to want to know because I know you're going to want the best for your kids too. Like, do yourself a favor before they're five years old and read this book. And, and also, I think now, COVID really did this too. Being more intentional, and I can say this to Californians as someone who's lived a lot in Minnesota, uh, a, a very hopelessly blue state, uh, being more and more intentional about where you live. 
meaning the city and the county that you live in. Uh, COVID showed us how much more impact that local control can have. Um, that's what I mean, what David's website, classicalchristian.org, has is a map where every school that's a classical Christian school is on a pin on a map. And I would move to a school. That's what my wife and I are doing, moving to a school. Just, I think it's that important that you can't say, well, here's the biggest problem, though. We all pay property taxes. And we probably move to a place that's nice because of the schools, and we pay those property taxes. And I think that's a hard thing to get past for some people, but ultimately, is that sacrifice worth the future of your kids and their, and their, uh, their souls and, their, and the way they view the world? So I, I think, yeah, pick, tell them to watch the movie. There's, a, you know, there's another benefit to this whole movement, which is, Pete refers to them sometimes as my school, that's good shorthand, but really I'm an association of members, so we just help these many independent schools, they're all independent. Outside of us, there are other organizations doing classical education. For example, Classical Conversations in the homeschool is doing the same thing for homeschoolers. So if, if your kids can't afford, uh, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars a year in tuition, homeschooling is a viable option. And there are many other options, pod schools. These are all, you know, classical Christian education is 2,000 years old. Nobody owns it. It's all of ours. We just have to recover it. Well stated. Over here. Hi. Um, I, um, I went through the whole um, the Catholic homeschool and I started my kid with that. He's, he's college now, we're, well, graduated. But I had a big problem, like what you said about progressive uh, plan, it was core curriculum. Even though we homeschooled, because I didn't have the money to go to your know, private, we homeschooled uh, Catholic through uh, a school up here in California, Napa. They still had core curriculum that we had to do, and I I stopped going there. I said I'm not going to do that anymore. And I tried, it and we did other things for his schooling and groups. But then when we wanted to go back to high school for sports and stuff, they wouldn't accept him. Like you said, accreditation. He had to go to an alternative school, and it was I'm, I I was so glad I was able to homeschool because. It just meant so much to me, and, and he was, he won, he, you know, he turned out great, you know, he's a <laughs> Eagle Scout and all that other stuff we did. <laughs> but, um, and so that was a big block for me. I said, what, why do we have to cater to this core curriculum still? And then one other thing I wanted to mention, I noticed that, I guess, LBJ, uh, he decided he didn't want to have school buses for Christians and Catholics. And so even though we're public, we pay, like you said, all the taxes for getting kids to the public schools, he eliminated taking kids to Christian schools. And I'd like to turn that around also and turn around the core curriculum thing hmm. to how we do that. The school bus thing sounds like a great challenge for the Supreme Court these days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the core curriculum is part of how they consolidate the control, obviously. Uh, David, how do, you, how do you navigate that core curriculum in classical Christian schools? We don't. They don't. <laughs> I mean, if, that's, when you don't take the king's gold um, at some level, not that you are, homeschooling is not that, but uh, you're right, though. I mean, if, if, when the testing at the high school level requires the core curriculum aspect, that's how they try to box most parents in, and it takes a lot of extra effort to do it on your own. Uh, and that's why I think the next step is also and we talk about this in the book, you know, the SAT just recently stopped uh, testing for reasoning uh, because reasoning is racist. <laughs> and the, the same guy that took over the SAT is the guy who, who uh, wrote Common Core, uh, which was a federalization of standards uh, under the Obama administration. Uh, so what David's linked up with is a, you know, classical learning test, a, a SAT for classical Christian schools. There's pipelines of curriculum for classical Christian schools. There's accreditations. Teachers' colleges need to be created. So it's, it's an entire ecosystem that's going to have to live parallel to a progressive pipeline that controls every single aspect, to your point. Michael, I think, has a question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You were born when my dad became president of the United States. So... I don't know if you're aware, but when he ran for president of the United States the first time, 
one of the main things in his campaign was to get rid of the Department of Education put forward by Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the one thing he's really upset with, after eight years of being President of the United States, he was never able to get rid of the Department of Education. <laughs> but I remember one of his great quotes is, you know, when we cease to be one nation under God, we're a nation gone under. <laughs> and and I, I quote that all of the time when I go out and speak to, to young people. Fantastic. Other than that, where can people get a list of these schools <laughs> for, us, for us people who have grandkids now? I, my, my parents sent me to a military academy, so well, I, like that. <laughs> you, I went to a place we called St. John's Miniature Alcatraz when I was a young guy. <laughs> I was taught by the Sisters of Mercy, <laughs> and then I went to the Jesuits, so God was having fun with me from the very beginning. But where do you get a list? So I have to give credit to my wife, Stormy, in the front row. She's our webmaster, and she has developed a great tool that you can sort by state, city, just pins on a map, anything you want, uh, classicalchristian.org, uh, school finder. Uh, she built that and it, it'll get you there fast. And each, every, pay, every school has its own page that you end up at because again, we're an association of like-minded uh, independent schools. And to your point, the reason your dad, I would believe, is so adamant in getting rid of it is because he knew how and why it was yep. created. Uh, we break that down in the book as well. I mean, a lot of the work that Rebecca has done focuses on that too. I mean, unions used to be conservative teacher associations, which were taken over by the unionization movement. Uh, then that union movement turned around and endorsed its first ever presidential candidate in 1976. The teachers unions had half the delegates at the 76 convention when they endorsed Jimmy Carter. Uh, when Jimmy Carter was elected president, he turn, turned around and gave a gift to those very same powerful teachers unions, which was the creation of the Federal Department of Education. And the NEA and the AFT openly bragged at that moment that there would be no Department of Education without the teachers unions. So from the very beginning, the Department of Education has been a creation of those teachers unions. And politically, they've tried to make it impossible for people who understand that to get rid of it because then you're anti-education. Uh, which, was, which was the problem amongst so many other weak-kneed Republican senators and congressmen of that, of that era who wouldn't be willing to make that move. I hope we're at a point where, because of how corrupt the unions are, especially after COVID, that being against something like the Department of Education can be decoupled from being against education. They've corrupted it so much, they've created an opportunity uh, to expose it. Yeah. We have time for one last question. I'm sorry, but we'll go over here. Thank you. Uh, my grandkids are homeschooled, which I started to learn a lot about it. My granddaughter, my granddaughter's a sophomore at Hillsdale, and uh, Larry Arn gets a lot of stuff out there. Uh, that he, he provides courses for kids through high school. You can get them free. He has on, online courses you can take, no charge. It's just absolutely wonderful. The, the reach they have is just amazing. And that college is hard to get into, and they have a, they have a tremendous uh, student body, and they have a, a, a code of honor like West uh, uh, the military academies. You break the code, you're kicked out. And one of the codes that they my granddaughter learned the hard way uh, when she was still in high school, she lied to her mother. Bad mistake. And so I get the phone call. And uh, Nikki said, talk to Emily. Problem? Yeah, she lied to me about doing, not doing homework. So I, I called my granddaughter, and I said, look, lying about your homework, not too good, but not doing your homework is simply a problem. You fix a problem, you own it, you fix it. Lying to your mother is a character flaw. You've lost her confidence. Never do that again. So when Hills, Hillsdale interviewed her, uh, and with the code, she said, Did, are we missing anything you think should be there? She said, yes, don't lie to yourself. And my grandson is just making Eagle Scott this month. Congratulations. It's, it's a funny thing. I was, I was just talking to Jason Chaffetz on his podcast about the book, and he was talking about his friend Trey Gowdy, and his friend Trey Gowdy said, you know what, in all my years of prosecuting, I've never prosecuted... I've, they said, when he gets a question about education, 
He says, you know what, I've never had to prosecute a homeschooled kid or an Eagle Scout. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got two of them here. Yeah. So that's, that's a testament to parents who've been ahead of the curve and willing to do something for their kids. And I think what's encouraging is that now there's a brick and mortar options and more online options too, to the point where we can get to a critical mass where we're pumping out three, four, five, six percent of graduates in this country that can be a part of the leadership change for the future of the nation. Each of you are gonna have an opportunity to say hi to Pete and David at the book signing that we're heading to now. And I just on behalf of this terrific audience want to say thank you so thank much you to both so of you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as our special guests leave the building.